Is on the base. This is a color copy of that. This is 12023, Kenny Clark, Wendell Marshall, and Hank Jones, the trio. And they're given just their own billing here. And like I said, this is the backbone of a lot of what Savoy does in 55, 56. Clark and Jones especially, but Wendell Marshall as well. Those three really are the foundation of a lot of the Savoy sound. This is 12024. William McKinley, it's not William, Ray McKinley, sorry, who's a drummer from the swing era. He's got Nick Travis on this, Mundell Lowe, who's one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, Bud Freeman shows up on this, Rusty Diedrich, Peanuts Hucko on the clarinet. Uh, great stuff. Lovely Red Savoy. These are tough records to come by. Uh, Man with the Horns is with three huge ensembles. It's Boyd Rayburn. And uh, he's a pretty big arranger. He's a pretty modern thinking, almost third stream. Some of it seems kind of classical in his leanings, but he has these big arranged productions. Uh, then this is number 12026. This is an outstanding record. Howard McGee and Milt Jackson. And Milt, of course, Vernon Diddles on the piano. Percy Heath and Jimmy Heath show up together here. And Joe Harris is on the drums. And Howard McGee is one of the great, sweet-toned trumpet players that's often overlooked. He comes from the bebop era. He's got a wonderful sweet tone. And if you put Kenny Dorham and Sweets Edison together, he's got the sweet melodic phrasing of a Sweets Edison with the modernity of a Kenny Dorham. He's kind of a bridge between the two in a way. You gotta love Howard McGee. Uh, this is the great Jimmy Scott, his first appearance on Savoy 12027. One of the great singers of even what is called a contra alto. So he's a really high pitched, he's a small diminutive man who had a condition that kept him kind of small and frail. And he had one of the most incredibly empathetic voices of the jazz era. This is John Mahegan Reflections, a great piano. He's accompanied by Kenny Clark. And so that's 12028, another great black and white cover. And for the most part, Sideway covers original pressings of the 12,000 series up to about 12,050 first pressings will always be black and white and a couple maybe a dozen and a half have had reuses with re reissued covers in fact the bohemia cafe record has three different covers so it's really confusing when you first start collecting Sa uh, savoy this is 12029 montage it's a collection of sessions a few a track here a track from this but there's some great musicians on these tracks eddie burt jared montrose hank jones kenny clark clyde lombardi uh one track is donald bird frank foster hank jones paul chambers and kenny clark that's a blue note lineup see what i'm saying uh fantastic stuff montage is a pretty tough record to come by and so that wraps up the first 30 savoy i'm gonna pause it and grab some more so 12030 is Jazz Youngblood. Uh, Lubinsky was in Ohio, saw these three young white cats playing some pretty serious jazz. So he brings them out to New Jersey and has Van Gelder record them with Kenny Clark and Vinnie Burke on the bass. Uh, choose Alfredo is on the tenor, choose, sorry, Choose Alfred. Uh, Ola Hansen's on the trombone, who shows up in a few other places. I never really knew who he was. He's a really great player. And then Chuck Lee's on the piano. It's a nice little tr uh, tr group, and especially when you have Vinnie Burke and Kenny Clark backing them up. And again, Rudy Van Gelder was the one engineering. And, and he does almost everything at this point at Savoy. If there's stuff that Van Gelder didn't do in 55, 56, it would probably be only that stuff from the late 40s that he wasn't there to record, but he seems to be even remastering that stuff. Uh, and one of the things about the Rudy Van Gelder that I think gets overlooked, I don't think he was necessarily the most sought after engineer in the New York area for his production skills or his home studio or his prices. It was his availability to black musicians. And most studios didn't make that allowance or weren't willing to, they would overbook a black group or not even take their business. And so instead of puttering around trying to find, you knew you could go to Van Gelder's and get it done. 
And so Van Gelder became the go-to for these three labels because it was tough finding other places that would take black musicians all the time. I think that's part of Van Gelder's legacy is almost by default he became the go-to. And that's not to say he didn't do a fantastic job. There are those out there who are critical of him, that they some talk about his bass levels. But again, he's, he's innovating as he's going, learning on the fly. He's doing all this out of his own home. And I don't think he was making a, a killing doing it. He probably made more money in the later years at Verve and you know, he continued to be remastering a lot of his work for decades into the 80s and 90s, you know. But that early stuff, he was probably more of a, a, a not a last resort, but the only resort. Uh, this is Laverne Smith. We talked about this not that long ago. A great New Orleans blues singer, 12031. And I can't find who the band is on that, but that's a great session. 12032 is the first indication of those blue note cats showing up. And this has fantastic Donald Byrd, Frank Foster, Hank Jones, Paul Chambers, and Kenny Clark. And so that song, a montage, is probably from these sessions as well. Uh, this Al Keola record, he's a fantastic little Italian American from the Newark area. He makes a couple records at Savoy, but then he goes on to United Artists and makes a lot of schlocky pop guitar jazz movie soundtracks and they're fun but they're lighthearted. Uh, his two recordings at Savoy are a little bit more in the honest integral jazz vein and they're tough to find and they're great. Uh, this has Benny Priven on the trumpet, Hank Jones on the piano, Clyde Lombardi's on the bass and of course Kenny Clark is on the drums. So Kenny Clark was such an instrumental figure and a go-to guy at the Sa in the Savoy sounds and the two places Kenny Clark don't show up is in the old 40s recordings, which is even on some of those, and then the Dixieland stuff. And this is P.B. Russell and Ruby Braff. Uh, this is in a New Orleans tradition here. And a lot of times these band members are anonymous to me. I don't know who they are. F. Me Resnick, Red Richards, John Field, Kenny John. And for the most part, on the Dixieland records, I don't really know who these people are gonna be. This is Wild Bill Davison, not to be confused with the organ player Wild Bill Davis or the sax player, Wild Bill Moore. Uh, Wild Bill Davison was a trumpet player, also kind of from that Dixieland tradition. This has Eddie Hubble on it, Frank Chase, John Vine, Johnny Field, and George Ween out of Boston is playing on the piano of Storyville Records and of the Newport Jazz Festival. That's George Ween. Uh, this is Opus to Jazz, 12036. This is a great record. Very modern, post-bebop. It's got the great Frank West of Count Basie's groups, Milt Jackson, Hank Jones, Eddie Jones of Basie's group, and Kenny Clark is on the drums. That's an incredible lineup. Milt Jackson, Frank West, Hank and Eddie Jones, and Kenny Clark. Outstanding record. And this one, it's second edition. All he did was add yellow to the title. That's That was the change. So the graphic, the, the graphic design department at Savoy leaves a lot to be desired. It's far from the modernity of what Reed Miles is doing at Blue Note. And even Savoy and Riverside have far more invested art departments. The art department at Savoy seems very much an afterthought and not worth throwing a penny at. And the covers that were reissued often are so just thrown together photographs and often look as dated or more dated than the original black and white photographs do. At least the black and white photographs have kind of a genuine article to them but Savoy's, even their redesigns are always just dated and feel very vintage, which is part of its charm. When you look at Sunny Red out of the blue on Blue Note, you can't even tell what decade that's from, let alone what year. And yet a lot of the Savoy stuff, it feels like it's from my grandma's basement. And that was part of my initial charm when I started collecting Savoy, was everything looked so dated and so vintage and reminded me of books of piano charts that were in my grandma's piano. You'd open that seat bench and pull those books out and they'd have covers that look kind of like these. The same color tones, the same use of different techniques. Uh, this is Hank Jones' quartet quintet. So Hank Jones gets some work as a leader. And this is with the great Donald Byrd, Eddie Jones on the bass, Kenny Clark, and then Matty Dice is on the trumpet. And that, for those who don't know, is a pseudonym for Hank Jones's younger brother, Thad Jones, on the trumpet. So the lineup here is essentially 
Donald Byrd and Thad Jones with the rhythm section of Kenny Clark, Hank Jones, and Eddie Jones. That's Blue Note royalty right there. These are, these are great records, man. Uh, 12038 is again a New Orleans jazz record. Punch Miller and Carrie, Mutt Carey. Punch Miller and Mutt Carey. Uh, Ralph Sutton, the great piano player, is on this, who has a nice record at Riverside early on. Edmund Hall, Pops Foster, uh, Baby Dodds is on the drums here. Uh, a lot more people than that. But there's quite a bit of a Dixieland revival happening. And you see it at Riverside. You see it at Blue Note with Cindy Bache stuff being reissued. Uh, there's a lot. Art Hodes. There's a ton of Dixieland stuff happening. And it was, it was still a pretty big part of the commercialized side of jazz, Dixieland. It still had a, a demographic that was into it. And so there was a lot of Dixieland revivalists coming up as young cats playing that Dixieland music. Because you could get work. You could play dance halls and old people's concerts. And it was a, a profitable thing. And yet most of that original Dixieland stuff has some uh, appeal today. A lot of the revival artists have really slipped through the cracks. And despite a lot of it being great, no one really knows or collects it. It sits in pretty much as... Which means I can collect it and add it to my collection from cheap and fill up my uh, discographies. But uh, this is Jolton Joe Rowland, a great uh, vibraphone player. Uh, he's got Wade Legg and Ron Jefferson on the drums here. Don T. Mar Martucci on the, on the bass. Uh, Oscar Pettiford and Freddie Red are on a couple tracks. Uh, the great singer Paula Castle appears on a couple tracks with Joe Puma and Ish Ugarte. That sounds like a fake name to me. I don't know who that would be on the bass. Ish Ugarte. And then Harold Grumsby's on the drums. Uh, Joe Rowland's a great player who also makes some records at Bethlehem and is worth looking into. And then going into 12040, this is Boyd Meets Stravinsky. So this is uh, his second record at Savoy. Uh, this is four different bands on it as well. I think it might have been taken from an earlier time frame. This is Jazz at Storyville, Volume 2. Same as Volume 1 with Ruby Braff and P.B. Russell. A lot of musicians are on that. Uh, this is a great record, 12042. And you can find these records for good prices. You can probably find this for 30 bucks. Uh, great condition, might climb up to 80. Uh, poor condition, you might get it for less than 30. Uh, on three tracks, you have Mill Jackson, Lucky Thompson, Wade Leggy, Wendell Marshall, and, and Kenny Clark. On six tracks, you have Milt Jackson, Kenny Clark, Kenny Dorham, Julius Watkins, Billy Mitchell, Cur Curly Russell, and Joe Harris. Rolling bags. I love the cover. love that tonality. Uh, they're, they're starting to add a little color tone into the back plates of some of these records. This is probably the most color a Savoy original record has at 12043. This is 478's worth of solo piano. Uh, with Marion McPartland, uh, Lenny Tristano, some early stuff, uh, Joe Bushkin, and Bobby Scott. All four of them are great players, and they each have four songs from the 78 sessions. Daisy. Top Brass is another fantastic session arranged by Ernie Wilkins of Count Basie fame. Uh, the band on this, Joe Wilder, Ernie Royal, Ray Copeland, Idris Suleiman, Donald Byrd, Hank Jones, Wendell Marshall, and Ken Kenny Clark. And so with Wilder, Royal, Copeland, Andrew Suleiman, you got, and Wilkins, you got a lot of Basieites again. So you really see that sprawl of Basie's kingdom of hard swinging, driving, blues infused jazz. This is the first session, first volume of the Jazz Composers Workshop. Uh, be careful if you use Wikipedia because they attribute this one to Duke Ellington. I'm sorry, to Charlie Mingus. And actually, the Charlie Mingus one is the second volume, not Wikipedia has it wrong. Uh, so this is with Jimmy Joffrey, Conti Condoli, Shorty Rogers, Bob Gordon, Frank Patchen, Joe Mondragon, Shelly Mann, Art Pepper, uh, Bill Russo. Pretty incredible musicians on the West Coast. Young White Cats that are showing some pretty modern uh, jazz composers. So it's Joffrey wanting to show off some of his chops. And Joffrey became a leading proponent of composition in jazz. You know, he's one of those guys that really starts to push the envelope some of his recordings in the late 50s, it's avant-garde before the avant-garde exists. He does some pretty edgy stuff. Uh, this is the dawning of the Modern Jazz Quartet, which at this point still includes Kenny Clark. Uh, Kenny Clark doesn't stick with the crew long. He goes back to being a session guy and eventually goes to Europe to join Francie Boland and tour the continent for decades. 
But this is, of course, Milt Jackson, the great John Lewis, Percy Heath, and Kenny Clark. And MJQ stays around for decades. Milt Jackson continues to make records on his own that are far more bluesy and gutsy. And the MJQ, here they're playing still kind of modern, but they can be very third stream, kind of crossed with classical at times, depending on what sessions you're looking at. John Lewis was a very modern, compositionally driven player. More Gillespie outtakes, 12047. Again, it's a compilation. It includes players like uh, Milt Jackson, Billy Graham, Joe Carroll, Stuff Smith, Percy Heath, even some John Coltrane, who was in Dizzy's band briefly. Al Cohn shows up here, uh, the great sax player, tenor player, who battled with Zoot Sims a lot. Uh, Al Cohn's a really great player. On uh, one side of this, you have Nick Travis with Al, Horace Silver, Curly Russell, and Max Roach. And then on the other track, you have Al Cohn with George Wallington, uh, Tommy Potter, and Tiny Khan. So another great Savoy, hard driving modern session. And this is a pair of pianos where Vinnie Burke's playing bass on both sides. On one side of the record, you have John Mahegan, and on the other side of the record, you have Johnny Costa. Uh, Johnny Costa is a great player who, from what I understood, I think if he's the guy recalling, he was from Pittsburgh. And he was incredibly virtuosic, uh, was traveling, went to New York, has, was, was making a name for himself, but the road was just not his thing, and he ended up going back to Pittsburgh and spent most of his life there being a proponent of jazz and teaching the art form, which is a pretty common outcome for the jazz musician. Uh, number 12050 is this Punch Miller Muck Carey. This is the same as Volume 1, same musicians kind of playing out the same way. 12051 is the Mighty Mike Quozo. Quoz, Quozo. Uh, great Italian name, Mighty Mike Quozo. And he didn't stick with jazz long. I think he went down, ended up being a car salesman. But he is a great fiery player. Uh, was making a real name for himself in New Jersey and uh, was really making some inroads. He's playing with the great Ronnie Ball, who's a fantastic piano player. Eddie Costa is on the vibes. Uh, Vinny Burke is on the bass, but Kenny Clark is on the drums. And this is Kenny Clark's 23rd appearance on this series. And we're on number 12051. So Kenny Clark's been on about half of them. This is the amazing Johnny Costa, the aforementioned Johnny Costa. This record took me a long time to track down. It's a solo piano, but what a great player he is. And again, Rudy Van Gelder's behind that. And I do like that cover quite a lot. One of my favorite Savoys, cover-wise and music-wise and lineup-wise, is this trio record, again, with Hank Jones, Wendell Marshall, and Kenny Clark. But they have guests, and the guests include people like Joe Wilder, Herbie Mann, Donald Byrd, Matty Dice again, who was Thad Jones, uh, Jerome Richardson, and Eddie Jones on the bass shows up on a track. So again, just fantastic uh, grandma basement graphics. The smell, it's all right there. This is uh, two great vibraphone players, Don Elliott and Cal Jader. Vibrations. And this is a tough record to come by. Hank Jones, Al McKibben, Kenny Clark is on some of this. Uh, Richard Wyans. Roy Haynes plays the drums on some of it with Kenny Clark. On the Don Elliott side, you have Phil Urso, Danny Banks, Jimmy Lyons, Aaron Fishkin, and Sid Balkin. Uh, on the organ, you get Doug Duke a little bit, Mort Herbert on the bass, and Sid Balkin on the drums. So there's quite a few different musicians on those sessions. This is ringside at Eddie Condon's with Eddie Condon, Cuddy Cutshell, Ed Hall, Gene Stroder, Bob Cozy, and a number of other players. Again, that's more Dixieland stuff. This is the great Phil Urso, uh, another great player that people kind of have forgotten about. Uh, the, some of the stuff's with Bob Brookemeyer, Percy Heath, Horace Silver, and Kenny Clark. Some of the stuff has Walter Bishop, Clyde Lombardi, and Sid Balkin. Uh, it's, he's a great player. You can hear some of Parker, you can hear some of Coleman Hawkins in him. Uh, fantastic, dynamic player. This is the second Al Keola record. And from what I know, what I can tell, this is the first Savoy multicolored cover. And again, it probably comes 1956. We're talking 12057. Kenny Clark's on the drums, Clyde Lombardi's on the bass, Ronnie Ball, Bernie Priven. And then on the other on the other tracks, you have Hank Jones, 
and Lombardi and Kenny Clark again. So they just change a member out there. One of my favorite records on the Savoy Canon is this Marlene Van Plank record. Uh, her husband also makes records at the label. Uh, this is with Herbie Mann, Hank Jones, Joe Wilder, Wendell Marshall, and Kenny Clark. And it's one of the greatest vocal jazz records I've ever heard. Uh, Joe Wilder is beyond my wildest dreams. He's just atmospheric and wonderful. And here's the second jazz composer's workshop. Again, with Mingus Laporta, Taylor Macero, uh, George Barrow, Mal Waldron, Rudy Nichols. On the other side, it's got Kenny Clark, Charlie Mingus, Taylor Macero, and Wally Cirillo. Uh, great stuff. Very modern. 1956. Sad Boy showing you that Ozzy Cadena and Teddy Reed, who might have already been departed at this point, they're trying to convince Lubisky to do the modern stuff. Anyway, so the first number that I don't have is 12060, and it's called Singing and Swinging. It's with Annie Ross and a number of other gals, and it was originally issued on Regent, Savoy's sister label in mono. And then, according to the Wikipedia discography, it was given the number 12060 on Savoy as well, but I don't, I can't find one anywhere on Discogs, on eBay. I can't even find it listed on Discogs as, as ever having been for sale. I can find plenty of the Regent numbers, 6,030, whatever it is. And then also Savoy reissues it in stereo with the same cover, 12,200 and something. And so from my, and I don't know, I can't remember Savoy ever reissuing a Regent title unless they reissued it to have the st stereo version out. So I'm pretty sure 12060 was never issued on Savoy. If it is, if you have one, 12060 singing and swinging with Annie Ross, let me know. But I've been looking for six months. I've never seen any hide nor hair of it. There's plenty of the Regent ones out there. There's plenty of the stereo ones from later out there. But as far as a mono 12060, I don't think it exists. And so we're going to leave it at that. 12061 is another fantastic session with the great Milt Jackson, Lucky Thompson, Wade Leggy, Wendell Marshall, Kenny Clark. Uh, this is the 27th appearance of Kenny Clark. Uh, Milt Jackson, Walter Benton, Frank Morgan, Jared Wilkins, uh, Percy Heath and Kenny Clark again. And on some of the tracks you have Julius Watkins, Bill Massey, Billy Mitchell, Walter Bishop, Nelson Boyd, and Joe Haynes. It's a great Milt Jackson session. This record here is a compilation called Swing, Not Spring. So the, the singing and swinging was supposed to be 60. I don't think it exists, at least not on Saturday. But Spring, Not Swing, Not Spring is also a compilation of four different sessions. Some of the musicians here include Frank Rosalino, uh, Thad Jones, Terry Gibbs, Stan Levy, Terry Pollard, Hal McCusick, Sal Salvador. Alvin Jones shows up here, Hank's youngest brother. Uh, some great sessions. That they called together into a little compilation. 12063, one of again my favorite Savoys. Uh, this has Hank Jones, one of the Marshall and Kenny Clark, with the fantastic Joe Wilder, who was one of the great unheralded trumpet players of the 40s, 50s. A guy people need to know more about. I've been trying to sell his message. But this speaking of message, this is the message of Hank Mobley, 12064. And it's the first of the law firm of Morgan, Mobley, and Bird. No, it's actually Bird's was first. But uh, four tracks on this has Donald Byrd, Hank Bowley, Ronnie Ball, Jul uh, Doug Watkins, and Kenny Clark. Some of those guys ended up becoming jazz messengers. And then we got Donald Byrd, John Laporta, Horace Silver, Wendell Martian, and Kenny Clark on the other tracks. Uh, really tough record to come by and really expensive as well nowadays. 12065 is Kluke's Clique. Kluke, of course, is the nickname for the great Kenny Clark. Uh, this actually is John Laporta on the cover, the sax player on this session, uh, who also plays with Donald Byrd, Ronnie Ball, and Wendell Marshall. So again, a fantastic record of hard driving, modern, post bop. Uh, this is Herbie Brock at the piano, 12066. Rudy Van Gelder produced it, just solo piano. He's a decent player. A record you can find for next to nothing. Uh, this is Bowen singing Slam, uh, Slam Stewart one of the bass players of the kind of crossover R&B jazz fusion age. Uh, on this record, uh, Weiss and West, Errol and Johnny, Mike, Brian, uh, this is kind of a tra tra trade over here of different sessions. Errol Garner, Johnny Garney, Arnie, Sam Weiss, and Harold West. Uh, he's a great player, and he also kind of learned to 
sing a harmony to what he was playing on the bass. So if he was playing that E major, he'd add that trip that third or that fifth on top of it and to give almost a chord sound that he became very famous for doing. Uh, this is more Lester Young stuff, recorded probably in the late 40s. Uh, Roy Haynes shows up in this Junior Mance. Bassie's on the piano on some of this. Cozy Cole, Hank D'Amico's actually on some of this. Uh, I'm guessing it's from the 78 sessions, but it was remastered by uh, Rudy Van Gelder. This is again, uh, more Herbie Brock, the piano player. I got a record you can find for next to nothing. And he's just like a good modern jazz piano player. Not, you know, nothing legendary, but notable and part of the Sad Boy legacy and part of the Newark legacy. Uh, one of my favorite Sad Boy covers is this Mill Jackson record, Jazz Skyline. Mill Jackson, Lucky Thompson, Hank Jones, one of the Marshall and Kenny, Kenny Clark. And that's the 31st appearance of Kenny Clark now. We're at number 70. So almost half of these records have Kenny Clark on them. And of that remaining that he's not on, half of those were recorded before his time with the label. And the other half are Dixieland records that he's not part of that scene. Uh, here's some more Lester Young sessions with the same lineup as the one we just looked at. Uh, a great record by Frank West. Again, a bassy fame. And this lineup here, Frank West, Frank Foster, Henry Coker, Benny Powell, Kenny Burrell, Eddie Jones, and Kenny Clark. That's almost all bassyites. Fantastic stuff. Night People by Her, uh, Herb Mort Hebert. Mort Hebert. He's a bass player. I have actually seen his name on a number of sessions since I found this record. Uh, it's like one of my favorite covers in the Savoy Canon. Uh, some interesting players appear on this. Sahib Shihab's on some of this. Ronnie Ball, Mike Cuozzo, Kenny Clark, of course, Joe Wilder. Sahib Shihab's on side two as well with Bobby Jasper, Dick Katz. So some pretty serious players with one of the great Savoy album covers, Times Square in the 50s in color. Now, this is a reissue. So it's not talking about the time, but this is loaded. A compilation again from four different sessions. You have Vito Musso, Kai Winding, uh, Gene Rowland, Boots Wasuli, Marty Napoleon, Ed Safransky on some of the tracks. Uh, some of the names that show up is Denzel Best and Sanford Gold, uh, Shorty Rogers, Shorty Allen, Shelly Mann. So there's a lot of great names on those sessions that they kind of lump together. And again, not like Blue Note where it's just integral recording session, album after album. A lot of Savoy stuff is hodgepodge together. There's a financial bottom line and a deadline to meet. It's holiday season, put a couple compilations out. It seems very mishamush, but there's still great recordings in jazz history throughout this period. From 45 to 1950, Savoy is, is one of the, probably the most important jazz label. And even in the early 50s, up to about 56, 57, Savoy's still one of the top five labels. And they certainly go into decline after that. But they straddle the LP era, and they really, because they come along a little earlier than most jazz fans, get overlooked an awful lot. And the fact that they've missed so much of the reissue programming is also how a lot of current fans don't know much about these artists, these records, and, uh, and they get overlooked. Uh, Ronnie Ball, who I mentioned a number of times, is a great pianist. He gets his own record here as a leader, and that's him right there. He gets to play with Willie Dennis and Ted Brown, along with Wendell Marshall and Kenny Clark. And so they basically, having Kenny and Wendell hold down, hold it down, guys. You know, and they just obviously trusted Kenny Clark for pretty much any session they were doing. Again, solo piano for John Mahegan. Rudy Van Gelder produced it. And this is actually a really tough record to find, largely because of that cover. You know, that cover becomes cheesecake. And so it's not out there for cheap, even though... Most of Mahegan's other records go for 15, 20, 30 bucks. That one usually climbs up to 60, 70 bucks. A great record by Chuck Wayne, the guitar player, who's on a lot of sessions. Uh, John Mahegan's on some of this. Vinnie Burke and Joe Morello. Uh, Chuck Wayne, Zut Sims, Brew Moore, George Duvivier, Ed Shaughnessy. Some serious players are on this. Uh, Wayne's a great player. He's got a bit of twang to what he does. And he's another guy that's kind of forgotten in the jazz landscape. Another bassiite, Frank Foster, with Benny Powell, Henry Coker, the trombone section of Basie, Kenny Burrell, Frank West, Eddie Jones, and Kenny Clark. So it's just, it just kind of keeps coming at you. Great title after great title. Uh, this is more Parker stuff from 45. 
Again, Miles Davis is going to show up on these sessions. And those would have been recorded by Teddy Reed as when he came to Savoy and started taking over. <clears throat> uh, up to 2080 now, 12,080. This is Jacksonville, another great Mill Jackson session. This has Rudy Van Gelder producing with uh, Ozzy Kadena over, overseeing it. Alan Stein with another name at Sideway who wrote a lot of the liner notes and oversaw some of the packaging and the promotion side of things. Uh, this record has Milt with Lucky Thompson, a fantastic tenor player, with Hank Jones, Wendell Marshall, and Kenny Clark, making that the 36th appearance of Kenny Clark. 36 appearances. Uh, this is George Wallington. I uh, was an Italian immigrant to America. He took on a more English sounding name with George Wallington. Some of this has Curly Russell and Max Roach. The other side has Kai Winding, Jerry Mulligan, Brew Moore, Curly Russell, and some others. Again, it's a pretty tough record find. 12081. 12082 was Johnny Coates at the piano with rhythm. This is with Wendell Marshall and Kenny Clark. Playing with another young piano player from the Newark area. Uh, Johnny Coates, it's a fine record. Again, that one's not too expensive, but it's rare. Uh, this is one of the most expensive Savoy records. Uh, I would like to find an original of this at some point. I have a Japanese copy for now. This is the Jasmine Detroit record, 12083. And it's Kenny Clark, of course, with four kids from Detroit. Uh, Paul Chambers, Pepper Adams, Kenny Burrell, and Tommy Flanagan. Uh, one of the most sought after Savoys. A great album cover. You have Detroit in the background. Uh, fantastic stuff. You know, on, on par with Blue Note Prestige all day long. Uh, this is solo Hank Jones now, and he's a, just a wonderful player uh, who, into the 90s and 2000s, was still one of the leaders of the piano of jazz. He was recognized a lot in his later years for his contributions, and he's really still sadly overlooked by a lot. This is Frank West's Opus and Swing, and a lot of Savoy titles don't get an official leader, per se, but Frank West is kind of attributed to this one at this point. Uh, but it's also including Kenny Burrell, uh, Freddie Green, Basie, Eddie Jones from Basie, and of course Frank West is from Basie, and Kenny Clark on the drums again. Uh, anytime you have Kenny, Kenny Clark with Kenny Burrell and Freddie Green, so you have K Freddie Green laying guitar rhythm and Burrell just like adding color. Fantastic. Uh, it's amazing how many of these Basie guys seem to have an open door at Savoy to be sidemen. And even Kenny Burrell seems to be appearing here a lot in this 56 era at Savoy. This is another kind of attributed to Frank West, featuring Frank West on the flute, trombones. And again, it's the bassy trombone section of Benny Powell, Henry Coker, Jimmy Cleveland, and Billy Hughes. The rhythm section has Freddie Green, uh, the great piano player Ron Albright, who has a record on uh, sister label uh, Regent. That's really hard to find, but it's really good with Kenny Burrell on it. Uh, Eddie Jones and Kenny Clark on the rhythm section. Again, this record's not too tough to find. Probably 40 bucks nowadays. 12087, another Hank Jones session with Kenny Clark, this time with Bobby Jasper. So you got to love, you got to love Hank Jones. You gotta love Kenny Clark. This is the Red Norvo Trio with Tal Farlow and Charlie Mingus. So in 1956, you have the guitar player Tal Farlow, who's made a lot of recording sessions for Norman Granz at Verve, and of course Mingus, who's yet to really establish himself on the landscape to become the giant that he ends up becoming. But again, Mingus's star, he was never a big household name in the 50s and even in the 60s. Even though he was on Atlantic Records, Mingus is something that I think we've discovered more posthumously, you know? He certainly had his following, you know, and, and Mingus Aum, he had some time on Columbia, which gave him a lot of exposure. But uh, this is uh, Surf Ride 12089. Again, this is a reissue from Japan. Uh, one of the tougher records to find. Art Pepper with Russ Freeman, Bobby White, Hampton Hawes, Joe Mondragon, Larry Bunker, Claude Williamson, Monty Bunk, Budwig. It's from three different sessions. So it's from earlier than 56. And it's pretty much those West Coast white kids from San Kenton's group that knew how to throw down. Another fantastic session, which leads us up here to 12090, the last 10. And this is uh, Jack Teagarden 
and Charlie Teagarden with Ben Pollock. More Dixieland stuff. Nice little record. This is uh, also a Japanese pressing. Another record I'd like to find an original of. 12091. This is Lee Morgan's debut with Hank Mobley's Quintet. And this is with Lee Morgan, Mobley, Hank Jones, Doug Watkins, and Art Taylor. And of course, Mobley's going to replace Hank Jones with Horace Silver. And him and Watkins are going to join our Blakey to start the Jazz Messengers. And then Silver and Mobley and Watkins go on their own. And then they all go on to their own careers. We lose Doug Watkins too early. But Morgan, early on, already displaying the ferocity of what he's about. 12092 is the great uh, Jazz Masters number two. Again, attributed to Hank Mobley at this point. Uh, Lee Morgan's on some of this with Watkins, Hank Jones, and Art Taylor. So some of it's probably out sessions from that. And then the other side has Donald Byrd, uh, Hank Mobley, Barry Harris, Doug Watkins, and Kenny Clark, which makes it the 42nd appearance of Kenny Clark. This is Midnight, uh, George Shearing Quintet on one side, and Red Norvo Trio on the other side. Charlie Mingo, uh, Charlie's Mingus and Tal Farlow are still on the uh, on the other side. Denzel Best, John Levy, Chuck Wayne, and Marjorie Hyams are on side one with George Shearing. Uh, Shearing was a UK piano player who was actually very popular and sold a lot of records to white Americans. Uh, again, it won't, won't be the last time Americans go to England for black American music. Won't be the last time. The Beatles are on that horizon, the Rolling Stones, Herman's Hermits. Like it's, it's sad how often we need to hear our own black culture music through the lens of a white British guy who appreciates it and go, golly, these British guys are so innovative and brilliant, ignoring the fact that they're playing American music. But it's made by blacks, so we're kind of unconditioned to hear that or value what they do. Uh, this is Paul Smith who's an important piano player whose name has been popping up more recently since I became familiar with him. Uh, he plays on some important sessions here and there. Great little piano player along with Tony Rizzi, Alvin Stoller, and Norman Selig. Uh, he's, he's a nice little player, and I think he ends up doing some Hollywood stuff, if I recall. My memory's fading. Uh, this is another Frank West session, 12095, Jazz for Playboys. And this has Joe Newman, the, the bassy trumpet player, and Thinkpin on drums, Eddie Jones on the bass, Kenny Burrell, and Freddie Green. So again, you have the two guitar lineup, and Gus Johnson's on the drums on a couple tracks, who is also of bassy fame. Uh, this is Trumpets All Out, 12096. Uh, some great trumpet players in here. Some of them are bassy. Uh, you have Art Farmer, uh, Emmett Berry, Charlie Shavers, Ernie Boyd, and Harold Baker, with Bobby Donaldson, Wendell Marshall, and Don Nancy on the piano. Uh, Rudy Van Gelder, of course. And Bobby Donaldson starts becoming a uh, drummer on more sessions right around this time and Kenny Clark starts fading out of the picture some. This is 12097, Looking for a Boy. Uh, Marion McPartland's on some of this. Uh, Adelaide Robbins, Barbara Carroll, three piano trios led by, by gals. Uh, nice record. 12098 was supposed to be a Georgie Ald session and this one I'm pretty much confirmed has never been, re never been issued. So 12060 I don't think was ever issued. I'm not positive. It was issued, like I said, on Regent and later on Savoy, but I don't think 12060 was ever issued. And then 12098 I know was never issued. George Yald, who goes back to the Benny Goodman Orchestra, a great sax player. If you remember those Playboy polls I showed you the other day, George Yald's highly ranked. He was making records at Emerson on the West Coast. He made the session for Savoy that didn't get issued. So he's kind of a name that has really become obscure today, but was very popular in the mid 50s. And then 12099 is Charlie Bird, Al Lucas, and Bobby Donaldson playing guitar with the great Charlie Bird. He's a fantastic guitar player. He's about to explode on the scene with Stan Getz and the Bossa Nova. He goes to Brazil shortly after this, but he's not quite on the Brazilian thing yet. This is still 1956. But he makes a couple more sessions for Savoy coming up. So that's the first 100 Savoys. And I do want to show you one more. I'll show you number 100, which I have sitting here. I think. And yeah, here it is. Again, this is more piano stuff, 120100. I just got this one. Uh, it's, it's four different series again, sessions. Hampton Hawes, John Mahegan, Herbie Nichols, and Paul Smith. So that's the first 100 Savoys. 
this has become a pretty long episode, so I'm going to do it in two parts. And hopefully people enjoy uh, seeing all this stuff. And it's quite a legacy. And when I do find those next four Savoy, I'll do the second chapter on this at that point. But I got a lot of other labels I want to kind of do this for if you guys enjoy this. So it's amazing how much time, space, geography, racial demographic, economics, it all plays into this stuff. And if you want to understand a jazz label, you need to understand where it was, who was it trying to sell its records to. Uh, Savoy's distribution was very much limited to the, to the East Coast, really the New York area. Uh, a lot of these New York labels didn't really get to the South, barely to the Midwest. You know, and as the migration of white flight happens, people start taking their record collections with them around the country. But uh, in the 50s, these records from these black labels were very limited to the inner city, black neighborhoods, uh, college neighborhoods, forward thinking kind of liberal kids. Uh, the older white America, as you saw in the Playboy polls, was buying Ellington still. You know, uh, Shorty Rogers, Stan Kenton, Woody Herman. They weren't really looking for Blue Note and Savoy and Prestige and Riverside. That wasn't really what they were interested in. They wanted, for the most part, a non-confrontational entertainment. And that's not to say a lot of white America might not have dug Coltrane, Rollins, Hank Mobley, Lee Morgan. But there's also a certain aspect of what will my neighbors say? And I might be able to listen to it without my neighbor hearing it, but my kids are gonna hear me playing these black musicians. And then they go outside and play with all the neighborhood kids. And those neighborhood kids are gonna eventually come home and say, Johnny's dad was playing those black records. You know what I mean? That was really how people saw it. You had to be worried about appearances. You know what I mean? You don't wanna be seen as socializing too much with those N words. And Armstrong, Basie, Ellington, Errol Garner, the ones who crossed over and became kind of safe, Nat Cole, Oscar Peterson, those names always seem to get into white homes, Ella Fitzgerald. But this young, aggressive, black jazz that was coming up in the 50s, post bebop, the average white American, even if they liked it, probably kept it pretty close to the vest. You know, and especially if you were a hip 38 year old with three kids in elementary school and you loved what was happening in jazz, you probably still kept it somewhat to yourself. You put on the Elephant's Jail records when the kids were around and you might put on a Coltrane Miles record when the kids went to bed. But again, appearances were so much and you didn't want to be ostracized by your own community and your own neighborhood and have your children pay the price of you essentially being a lover of black people, a lover of the N-word. You know, it's it's really crazy how racially impacted jazz is commercially. It's It can't be overestimated. Almost all these black greats that we worship today and idolize today lived in pretty complete obscurity. And even Miles in 57 and 58 wasn't climbing higher then I think eighth in the one pole in 57 and 58, I think he was fifth or fourth. So he was still behind white guys that we don't give no shits about today. So it's a very interesting convoluted scene that the record labels and the cities that those record labels are from and then the men who ran those record labels all starts to inform us about what these records meant, what these musicians meant, how important it was, what sacrifice was made and how much of a hero guys like Van Gelder, Ozzy Kadena, Teddy Reed, and even Herman Lubinsky end up being for preserving this great heritage of the American struggle. I'm the Jazz Shepherd. Y'all stay safe. Talk to you soon. Peace.